Welcome to Food Farm Talk on CFRU 93.3 FM in Guelph, Ontario, Canada, and on podcast on all the major platforms. I'm Paul Smith, one of the hosts of Food Farm Talk. The others are Emily Duncan and Abdul Rahim Abdullahi. Please follow the podcast and our social media feeds. This episode has a power panel discussion with Mel Limus chairing a pa- panel of uh, very knowledgeable people in Ontario agriculture. Crystal McKay, Dan Pitker, Cher Merriweather, and Alphonse Weersink, who discuss some of the major challenges in 21st century agriculture and the ideas drawn from Roger Martin's book, When More Is Not Better. This is a third of four episodes focusing on a discussion with management guru Roger Martin and his ideas at the Virtual Midwest Cover Crops Council Conference on February 24th, 2021. These are made available courtesy of Soils at Guelph. Okay, next up, we are moving into a panel that's uh, an all-star panel in Ontario that's going to unpack what Roger was just speaking about. They've all read the book as well and are really just applying it to the different perspectives that we um, that they all have in agriculture. So um, start up, I'll, I'll just introduce everyone. Uh, Crystal Mackay. Crystal connects consumers, farmers, and food system partners with the goal of earning public trust in food and farming. She has served as the founding CEO of Farm and Food Care, the Canadian Center for Food Integrity, and most recently her own company, Loft32. So welcome, Crystal. Uh, And next up is Dan Petker. Dan, the one that we were talking about. Uh, Dan is a chef turned farmer with a passion for soil health. He is now the third generation on his family's farm near Port Port Rowan, right along the shores of Lake Erie. He farms with his father, growing corn, soybeans, wheat, hay, and of course, cover crops. Uh, Cher Mirweather is a leader in food and beverage industry sustainability, working to build a more resilient food system, one company at a time. She is the founding CEO of Provision Coalition, and she currently sits on the board of directors of the National Zero Waste Council and Birds Canada. And last but not least, Dr. Alphonse Weersink. Alphonse is a professor and researcher at the Department of Food, Agricultural and Resource Economics at the University of Guelph. His research focuses on the impact of new technology and government policy on farmers' decisions, and then the impact of farmers' decisions on markets and the environment. So uh, welcome all four of you, Crystal, Dan, Cher, and Alphonse. Hey guys. We're gonna get started with a, a free-for-all question. Um, kind of along Roger's book, um, this drive for efficiency comes at the expense of resiliency and there's unintended consequences. What are some of the examples of unintended consequences that you see in the agri-food system um, where are the places uh, that we could use a little bit more resilience, would you say? Um, who shall I pick on first? Uh, Crystal? Sure. I, I was uh, timing to see when it would be you're on mute, you know, the race to the bottom. Yes. The first to have to say you're on mute. So I, yes. I won the first round. Uh, thank you so much for being uh, part of this event and this opportunity to be part of this discussion. I had all my thoughts lined up and then my brain was racing really quickly while Roger was speaking of all kinds of other ideas. Uh, but I'll, I'll stick with my original example. I think, um, in and, you know, as you mentioned in my intro, my interest is is in public trust in our food system that starts at the farm and goes right through to the retailer. And the biggest example I would say of unintended consequences uh, of a sector that focused on efficiency and growth at the expense of community sustainability and environment uh, would be the worst case example would be uh, Manitoba pork, uh, where they weren't allowed to build pig barns for eight years. And uh, so all my crop friends are like, why are you talking about pigs? Uh, well, pigs eat a lot of crops and you, sh- you know that. So, um, which, and it affects the feed business too. So it, they, and Manitoba had plans to double pork production in their province, uh, but with very little regard for community and social responsibility. So uh, the best science, 
science, the best technology, the best how to. Um, and, you know, as we always say, science says if you can, it doesn't say if you should. And so uh, with the race to efficiency, can we raise the most, uh, you know, the most pigs, uh, you know, pr feed efficiency, et cetera, without enough regard for the other aspects of um, the balance of your actually feeding people. And if you're not allowed to build a pig barn, then all your efficiency doesn't matter. Yeah. When you've lost that trust, it doesn't matter how much efficiency you have. Exactly. Um, uh, Dan, what would you say to that from your perspective? Oh, I fully agree. And um, I think the neat part is unintended consequences as we try to resolve those issues, they also, like, you can have a cascade effect. So mm -hmm. like when Roger brought up DDT, so we have eggshell thinning from the over application of DDT throughout North America. Now we have a, we have a massive ban on it. And most of us in North America would say that's a great thing. So do the birds. Yeah. But if you go to regions where malaria is a big, big deal, if you get rid of DDT there, malaria skyrockets again because the mosquito control is gone. So, you know, we think we have a good resolution to what we, what a problem that we created for ourselves, but that doesn't mean it always can be translated someplace else. So like mm -hmm. DDT is still used around the world. It's used in our mosquito nets and that sort of thing. So it's, um, I was kind of raised in a way to always give a lot of forethought before you do an action and a lot of post thought to the action that you did. Well, actually to the results of the action. Um, so consequences, we're always watching for them, whether they're unattended, like, well, that's actually a good thing because it's a challenge now. And it makes you rethink the process that you just went through and it kind of sharpens and, and, and well, as part of the resiliency of the whole process. Mm -hmm. Anything else that you see as an unintended consequence of this, what we were talking about, that drive for bushels per acre, bushels per acre, what do you well, see then, as the well, So there, that is a, uh, if it's just drive for bushels per acre, like then it's just a drive of numbers. So spreadsheets do everything we want. Um, so let's say this case of me losing some, some land, that other op farm operation, those economics work better for him. Mm -hmm. But now you have like this ramification of, I drove by the farm today and we're having a minor thaw event. The farm is starting to wash away. So just that, so it's an unintended consequence. Well, it was an expected consequence from my action of saying no, but it's an unintended consequence from for the, the landlord to just go get an extra 10 bucks an acre. Um, it's a constant struggle, but I don't know. That's kind of where, what I see. Yeah, I, um, Roger quotes in his book, um, there's no side effects. There's only effects. We exactly. just call it once we don't like side effects. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Cher, what do, what do you think are the unintended consequences? I see two real uh, unintended consequences. One is connected to the natural system and the other is connected to our people. Of course, on the natural system side, we're seeing the impacts on the natural environment. We're seeing the impacts of climate change, the impacts of waste, whether that's food waste or plastics or just waste in general. So we've become disconnected from our drive for efficiency and productivity and what that impact is on the natural system. And then the other serious unintended consequence is that connection back to our people. So the drive for efficiency and productivity and that machine thinking has disconnected us from the people side of it. And so when we think about the cultures of our organization, typically what we'll see is sort of three different types of cultures. We've all seen sort of the, the degenerative, I'll call it, where you know the, they, they don't care about their people, they don't take care of their people, the organizational structure is, is all over the place, communication is uh, rampant, they don't, they don't communicate across the systems, it's very dysfunctional. And then there's sort of the transactional is what I would call it, the, the sec second tier where, you know, they're starting to see some improvement in their organizational structure. They're, they're starting to see some uh, communication flows, but not all the time. And people are starting to be empowered, but not all the time. 
And I think when we have this machine thinking, the best we can get is a, to a transactional environment. That's the best hope, right? Because there's this, this impetus that it's a machine. And so when something breaks, we just replace it. There's no care about the people side of it. And what we should be striving for is this systems approach in which we have a regenerative culture where the people are the ones who create the system, where information flows so they can do their best work, where they are empowered and they can stand with the company for something more than just making money. So for me, that's the unintended consequence is that we can never get to that living system, healthy culture because we are constantly focused on the machine, right? You hear this language all the time, like let's you know, push the needle. Even our references are <laughs> machine-like. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's brilliant, Cher. And paints a picture of a world that I would rather live in, you know? Um, Alphonse, what are your thoughts on the unintended consequences? Well, you framed it in the idea that uh, this drive for greater efficiency and the lack of lack of slack in the system. You know, the, what yeah. uh, Roger talked about and uh, the need for some surplus and as a result, resiliency. I think that was highlighted a year ago about with COVID, uh, the pandemic closing the hospitality sector and. You know, our, our supply chains have evolved over time to deliver food at the lowest possible at the lowest possible cost and in quantities that uh, it's almost unimaginable, right? And uh, and so farmers specialized, uh, processors specialized, and especially distribution networks. Something that I don't think most of the people in this uh, forum would be aware of, but the the those distributions are focused either on the hospitality sector or on the food retail sector. And then with the pandemic, uh, the hospitality sector was closed. And uh, and so that distribution sector dealing with them was closed. The processors had to change the nature of their product and the volume of product, and there was no give in the system. And so for a while, there was real questions about the ability of the system to respond and uh, and questions about its resiliency. Um, so that would be an example there where some surplus would have helped deal with that. Um, now, I think the system has responded remarkably well. And so questions about, well, maybe we have got the appropriate balance between resiliency and, and efficiency. Maybe not. Or are, are consumers going to reward uh, those companies that display resiliency and and maybe that means that a greater demand for local products so yeah no oh, good point what about those um those metrics that we talked about those proxies um in from your perspective again because you're coming from uh different perspectives in the agri-food system how are we measuring success what is what is that metric um and what impact is that metric having and what might be a better way of measuring success in, in the agri-food system? Um, Cher, what do you think? <laughs> you know, what, typ <laughs> typically what we're, uh, absolutely. <laughs> you know, typically what we're seeing uh, when we're engaging with food and beverage companies is that they're measuring the typical stuff, right? My operational equipment efficiency, my labor productivity, so that's what we're seeing, and there's this hyper focus on those two pieces uh, that you know that Roger talked about in his book as well. And what I would su suggest is you always measure what you manage, right? Or you manage what you measure. Yeah. And it's the introduction of new things that are maybe perhaps more qualitative. So we just uh, started a partnership with In Rhythm out of um, out of the U.S. to deliver what we're calling organizational health, and so it's an actual measurement that allows us to understand, well, what's the health of this culture? And so all of a sudden you can say, well, we can drive for operational equipment efficiency and we can drive for labor productivity, but what's happening to the health of the organization as a result? And if we introduce that type of a measure that says, actually, uh, what we're seeing is that our culture is quite degenerative. What can we do to fix that and bring in some of those qualitative matters? Then we're gonna have a better balance of how we manage what we measure. Yeah. Sure. Can I just, like, as an as extension of that, like, let's say in agriculture, we're all like kind of like 
Well, I guess in a lot of business, or uh, we're all um, we all think in units. So be it bushels per acre, ROI per acre, that sort of thing. And we can bring it down to um, like in relation to this conference, mm -hmm. soil health, company health, business health, family health. Like, how do you apply a unit so that we can conceptualize these things? Um, because they're so amorphous and big that a lot of us, or like a lot of us, don't know how to answer and and really conceptualize what it is. So if you can't kind of envision that thing, how do you approach it and 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 manifest it and make it better or just even start with it? Oh, Crystal, I'd be interested to hear what um, what do you think are those metrics and how we might be able to improve improve them to. Well, I would say, uh, you know, I always think about when uh, farm groups go to lobby um, government, they always start with um, GDP, how many jobs, uh, what they contribute to the economy. And then on the farm, you know, we have our economic, you know, our profit and loss statement, right? Very much, uh, you know, how many dollars per acre, et cetera. Um, I definitely feel, uh, I, first of all, I grew up with Sesame Street, so collaboration and sharing is important to me. And uh, I didn't even realize I was uh, already living Roger's uh, advice about go instead of A or B, come up with a better solution. And I would say I've never seen a more opportune time than now to come up with better solutions, outcome-based, and uh look at new ways to measure success because uh, if I, I you know if I stick with my pork example if anybody's been following hog prices our hog farmers have been bleeding for a long time and so uh, they're the ones that are buying your feed and uh, your crops and if we want Canada to grow X crop or sub in yours here then at what cost do we not have a better way of measuring success and uh, rewarding it so I feel our existing metrics are off uh, we definitely need to look at new outcome based uh, measures that um, because basically I'm seeing the pressure we're getting we're asked to put values on our value system now yes. and we're being paid commodity prices and it's the farmer and processors are in the pressure cooker of I'm being asked all these demands for sustainability quality assurance code of practice audits you want me to do all these things but then you're still paying me a commodity price and the old system it's not equipped to deal with it. That's that's a great point. Alphonse, do you have some thoughts on that as well? Well, yeah, I mean, it's so, you know, measuring what to, to do what. So, you know, an individual firm, yeah. an individual business, you know, they've got to make money, but there are other lifestyle factors. And then, you know, as a sector, like a whole, like the hog sector that uh, Crystal's talking about, um, you want you want farmers to be successful. You want the sector to be successful as well. You want them to be competitive. And that might not necessarily mean that you keep every farmer in business as well, right? That it, there's questions about that. And then you're sort of broadening it out to the impact that, that the sector has on the environment. And so there are other metrics than you are, are trying to, uh, to assess. I think one of the things that stood out for me from Rogers is uh, is that don't worry too much about the metrics and just try to improve all the time. And yeah. uh, that's, uh, you know, when I think that's part of the reason why we trying to have something like soil health, because there's so many different elements to it. It's like a catch all. We're going to improve soil health because it does so many good things. But you try to focus on one, it's pretty difficult. Yeah, he, he did discuss. Um, in the book, like making opposing metrics, that that creates the tension whereby you you start looking for that option C. In um, mm. I think you talked about Southwest Airlines said we're going to have the lowest lowest price ticket airfare airfare and the best customer service. Right. They, so mm -hmm. they didn't they weren't settling for a trade off. Oh, it has to be this because we can't do this. They were making no excuses by making those opposing metrics. Mm -hmm. um, like from personal experience, like I have these like this firm held belief in in doing things in a socially and environmentally uh, responsible way. 
as many of the people who are uh, involved in this conference. Um, but it's a, it's a, we have a lot of headwind that we're going against because there's so much inertia to the system that we're trying to um, like help guide a little bit. Like we are steer, trying to steer a ginormous boat and our little tugboat isn't strong enough yet. So either actually, actually just kill my business or the approach. Um, I don't know, I really don't know. Alphonse, has an economist I, solved this? Yeah, no, I think, uh, you know, like Roger suggested for uh, the solution for Dan was to come up with a net present value of uh, his practices using cover crops or whatever else he does and uh, compare that to the net present value of uh, the, the practices that some guy is just going to come in and, uh, you know, do the min bare minimum. Um, it's just difficult to do because, you know, he talked about this cause and effect relationship. There's such a, it's a stochastic relationship. It's, uh, and, and we've got, um, and it's a long time frame. It's one year. It's not like uh, something in a, in a factory where we can change day by day and find out or even minute by minute. You know, we've got one year. So we pra practice, uh, we plant cover crops one year and we see the carbon go up by this little bit and uh, and well maybe it didn't go up by this little bit because we had a bad rainstorm but you know next year it would have gone up by this little bit if we had the right weather so it's it's difficult to do in agriculture because of this this gap between cause and effect and uh, it's difficult to demonstrate that net present value you know if that was if that was going to be the solution, then yeah, we could see. You know, and, and just as a, as a energy or to continue on that, because it, like Mel, you 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 brought the question up quite well, and the problem is there is no um, like the landlord doesn't lose any value in the farm. We could still sell that acreage. Like it could be some rundown piece of garbage, and somebody will still go pay. 13 to 30,000 bucks an acre. Like it makes no sense. So like the landowner landlord doesn't really care unless they have like this, uh, this, well, like a lot of us, like this deep abiding desire to be societally responsible and environmentally responsible. And then, then he has to have enough economy to carry that. Um. <laughs> What about further on down the value chain share? Um, like you, you're working with businesses that have to make some huge investments to be sustainable. And how, how does that decision happen with them? <laughs> you know what, further down the supply chain, it's the consumer pressure, right? It's, it's yeah. that the activism that's coming from the consumers. I mean, look at what happened when we saw the straw stuck in the turtle's nose. Suddenly we were facing a, you know, a single use plastic ban on straws and cutlery because the consumer said, thou shall stop this. I do not want to see a turtle with a straw up its nose. So, you know, those are the drivers, right? Is the, is the consumer saying, you know what? I need change. I need to know that the soil mm -hmm. system is healthy. I need to know that I'm going to be able to buy local crops and that, that, you know, the local food economy is going to be viable and resilient into the future. Certainly, we've seen that with COVID, right? I mean, when I talk to some of the local food companies, they're like, this is the best year I've ever had because customers are coming out of the woodwork and they just want to buy direct to me because I'm simply local and I I stand for something in my business, right? I, I care about the natural environment. I care about my people and I care about uh, being a local business and they want to support that. And I think that's what's going to drive the change is when the consumer makes it makes a difference with the dollars that they spend. How quickly are they going to stop caring, though, like once life kind of goes <laughs> back to normal? Because that that operation, like he hasn't changed or she like that. Their approach has always been what it is. So they've always been. Proper, like in the context of this conversation. Yeah. But now they've just been noticed. That's right. And that's the biggest fear, right, is that when we return to the new normal, are we, in fact, going to lose those customers or are we going to shift back into the old ways? Right. And I think the onus is on the company to 
to be, have that strength uh, in its storytelling, in its transparency, in its authenticity, in the verification of its data that says this is the right choice and that the responsibility is on the company to keep that customer, that they are the better choice. That's fair, yeah. Uh, I would chime in there. I heard uh, I heard from a grocery executive last week in the prairies who said support for local was up 82 percent. And uh, he, he was very innovative where he said they identified processing bottlenecks that they didn't have enough uh, access to, for example, a jam making facility locally or uh, pickles. They were importing pickles from India and people are like, don't we grow cucumbers in Canada? So uh, the retailer was actually finding new new processing partners to supply what the consumer wanted, which I've never seen that happen before. Um, but it, it was driven to Cher's point by this 82% demand for Canadian product. And so um, I think what Roger said is really important here because uh, lots of my friends grow crops and what you're doing in cover crops seems so far away from pickles or the grocery store. <laughs> and so, but the reality is, you know, using my pork example or any of these other products, you are part of the food system somehow, eventually. So how do we connect those dots and say, um, what can you do add value to what's happening at the other end of the supply chain? So as a commodity grower of corn and beans, where we are selling into a world market, yes. how do we do that, right? Like yeah. when we see a tender from China or Libya for 300,000 ton of X, mm -hmm. The pool supplies it. Like they don't care that my acreage was grown in a sustainable way. Um, well, one one thing I would say uh, that I see is really positive is I you know I've been on this bandwagon of promoting Canadian farmers and farming for a long time. Yeah. And processors specifically used to be very reluctant to do a made in Canada, even the little blue cow on dairy, any of that stuff. And you know why? To your point, Dan, they wanted the chance to buy something cheap on sale somewhere else. And if they yeah. got too married to the Canadian flag on their product, uh, they wouldn't have that flexibility to buy what's on sale. So now we're seeing more and more of them shift to that and so this concept of creating more of a made in Canada value proposition, not being Pollyanna, the commodity markets are real, I get that, but I do see some real made in Canada value proposition. And the example I'll share that this retailer used that I felt was really powerful was fair trade coffee. Regular commodity coffee was a dollar a pound. Fair trade coffee was a dollar eighty, with that eighty cents going directly back to the farmers. But it included that's not a small amount of difference. Like that's a huge percentage. But it was a new system. So if we use uh, what Alphonse said about you know we're we're in a continuous improvement model, it's kind of like I need a raise, but my base pay is wrong. Uh, so that two percent <laughs> raise you're going to give me is not helping, right? So right. I think we need a fresh approach to some of these systems to say continuous improvement on its own is not going to get us to where we need to land. <laughs> totally cool. <laughs> no, it's, it's, All right, let's so get right. some ideas. <laughs> yeah. Okay, keep them coming. <laughs> yeah, the commodity market won't change. I mean, that's uh, that's number two yellow corn is going to be number two yellow corn, and China's going to buy it from whoever will supply it cheapest. But I think what, uh, what the panel has mentioned is that there's an increasingly demand for some quality attributes uh, associated with the production of corn. Uh, yeah. not, the, not the quantity attributes, but in terms of how it's grown and whether it's local, whether it's uh, you know meeting some environmental standard. And increasingly, it's coming from the, the final end of the, the uh, supply chain, the consumers or, you know, the McDonald's, the A&Ws who are deciding what it is, is sustainable. Thanks for listening to Food Farm Talk on 93.3 FM CFRU in Guelph or on podcast. Please check our podcast show notes and social media for links to Roger Martin's work, the Midwest Cover Crop Council and Soils at Guelph at the University of Guelph. A special thanks to Cam Ogilvy of Soils at Guelph for making these audio files available from this lecture. Please tune in again for another topical episode.